Delighted to be here and to be presenting on work we are doing on machine learning applications at Plant Labs uh, with this vibrant community of practitioners and technical leaders we've assembled here. So I lead the imagery analytics and analytics engineering function at Planet. And I want to tell you a little bit more about our company before we get into the actual applications. So here are a few Earth observation scenarios that I felt are worth slightly deeper thought. So an illegal logging road appears in the middle of a rainforest, and thousand-year-old trees are like lost forever. Now the scenarios of a plane departing an area of interest and a military loses situational awareness and a community is devastated by a natural disaster, and a local government has challenges effectively tasking their, uh, their resourcing and emergency responder staff. The last three images that you saw were from our catalog of imagery. So Planet was founded seven years ago with the mission of imaging the world every day and making change visible, act accessible, and actionable. So we operate three uh, constellations of satellites, what we call RapidEye, our flagship DAO uh, satellite constellation, and SkySats. The DAOs form the largest constellation of Earth observation imagery satellites ever in orbit. Uh, we have 130 plus of them uh, currently. Uh, they image the Earth at a ground sampling distance between three and five meters. Uh, you can think of them as a, a low, the size of a loaf of bread, a telescope in a box with a camera and radio. And uh, these are in, organized in a polar orbit, uh, what we call a sun synchronous orbit. They image the Earth like a line scanner. So this allows you to like, capture imagery at this resolution. And what we built out is the imaging pipeline that assembles all this imagery and builds a rich catalog of imagery products. So this is accessible to developers all over the world through a very simple, consistent, user-friendly API. So you can read the catalog as the processing levels and the banding structure. So PlanetScope offers a four-band structure, which is uh, red, green, blue, and near infrared. And our SkySat imagery products uh, allow for a panchromatic band that allows for sharper, higher resolution imagery. So uh, through this rich catalog, uh, we are able to make the imagery uh, from our Earth observation uh, more accessible. So we serve that imagery to a range of different verticals. We serve defense and intelligence. We serve precision agriculture, uh, finance and business intelligence is another vertical we sell widely to. And what I wanted to spend the rest of uh, my time with you speaking about is our forward-looking vision. It's where uh, Earth observation space meets uh, machine learning and intelligent capabilities. So we aspire to be the premium web platform for geospatial analytics. Uh, this is where our imagery comes together with state-of-the-art uh, open source and private models that uh, our cells can build foundational uh, analytics on, and we can connect them with third-party uh, customer as well as partner analytic applications which provide rich geospatial capabilities. So um, natural disasters like what we're experiencing right now and in the last week uh, in close proximity of the, to the San Francisco Bay Area are serious and they impact the lives and livelihood of thousands of people. Uh, remote sensing and earth observation imagery provides a very significant capability towards the effectiveness of disaster response. We believe that our data set has a strong affinity towards building capabilities that can enable uh, responder efforts and disaster assessment. So I wanted to walk you through an exercise of using our data uh, towards creating some core object detection capabilities which are using supervised learning, state of the art from open source, and building some of those geospatial analytics. So we looked at like our catalog of imagery and disasters that have happened, natural disasters over 2017 and early 2018, and 
uh, you can see the sampling. This is kind of the, uh, uh, the source, spatial extent of a regions that we sampled. And here's an example. You know, Hurricane Irma was one of the biggest natural disasters that hit the United States and continental North America in September last year, and it hit Miami. So here is an example of our collects exactly during the days when those, those disasters hit. And what you're seeing is a collection of uh, imagery from our different satellites, uh, the SkySat constellation at close to 0.8 ground sampling distance and uh, 3.7 meters from the planet scope imagery. So this is what the, uh, the spatial extent actually looks like on the ground. It's an example of our mosaic. So like Bean did a great job explaining to us interpretability of models. I think what also closely couples with that is the engineering around data collection funnels. So we're of the belief that the effort put into collecting the right kind of data targeting supervised learning approaches and the energy invested in that always offers like fairly significant results. So one can think of data collection funnels as always in like three steps. It's like collecting the right uh, spatial extent and scenes, sampling them and chipping them effectively, and then training, you know, annotating them for the supervised uh, learning tasks you're trying to uh, develop automated capabilities on. So here's an example. If you look at a disaster region and the spatial extent and sampling them, what you see in green are uh, the samples where we were looking for railway vehicles and where we have coverage. We can then chip those to create smaller uh, examples of like Earth observation imagery which overlap with regions where there are railway vehicles. And that's what we send to a crowd for annotation. And the second step we always take is beyond uh, crowd annotation, we do an expert annotation step that allows for like highly curated uh, supervised learning uh, data set uh, that has bounding boxes and associated classification. So through repeating that process over the course of a couple of weeks, we built out this ontology uh, which has you know, land use types like buildings, aircrafts, watercrafts, and miscellaneous objects. And this is the ontology on SkySat. You can build a similar ontology on our planet scope imagery. And together, it gives you a catalog of objects that are discernible and localizable within our imagery. So here are a few examples. These are planes in SkySat and planet scope imagery. Here are railway vehicles in uh, different regions. And here are examples of buildings and their annotations in urban as well as residential regions. And it gives you a sense of the scale and scope of like coverage you can have in disaster regions for object detection. So through that effort, what we do, did get to is a data collect, which is in the range of like 25 different classes, having close to 50,000 annotated samples, which puts us pretty much in the realm of what you see as like open source challenge worthy data sets. And this is a relatively quick effort. So one can always think that if you did that collection over a longer period of time, through our daily cadence, we can have like the first part of that data collection funnel repeatable and covering the same regions, annotating similar objects and getting that to a much higher volume, which gets us in the realm of like some of the supervised learning approaches that we've been exploring. So I wanted to walk through uh, what uh, simple steps towards model uh, performance characterization uh, when we did try out that particular data set collection, the second phase is how do we evaluate state-of-the-art models around that. So this is fairly st industry standard where we pick up labeled chips, have those collections and benchmark them against baseline model inferences. So here's an example where we are running a baseline model uh, performance, which is just like a stock SSD model on all those classes, but this is pre-expert curation. So this is just right out for crowd vendor. We're getting those annotated bounding boxes. We believe those to be ground truth, and we benchmark how the model performs. And then uh, we run it through expert curation. And this is exactly the same model with the same set of hyperparameters, and these are the results you see. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you spend enough time in your data collection funnel, spend enough time on curating a golden data set of like high quality annotations, then the energy you invest in model tuning 
can be efficiently used. So here are a few other alternate views towards performance characterization. So in the ontology that I showed you earlier, there's like a range of different objects. One can classify them into like small, medium, and large, and look at how their performance varies. When you look at stock models like FASTA RCNN or uh, single shot detection SSE models and characterize their performance and benchmark the, them against not just confidence but against IU thresholds. And unlike some machine learning applications that you'll hear about later today, in the context of Earth observation imagery and object detection there, you can actually go with fairly low IU thresholds because you're, not, you're trying to detect the presence or absence of objects you're not trying to actually modify a robotic arm or something like that where you need very high IAU uh, thresholds. So that's exciting. And here's where you can pick the knee for where you choose your IAU threshold to be set. Similarly, look at precision recall for like just these stock models with different IAU thresholds. It's pretty, uh, pretty uh, intuitive that when you, uh, for a specific precision value, like when you lower your IAU threshold, you get like higher recall numbers, and through that you can determine what's the model parameters you want to set for getting to a specific level of performance. So, so far I spend most of the time talking about like single instance or single timestamp analytics. So what our catalog offers is a rich stack of like imagery uh, over a single location. Uh, over different timestamps because of our daily cadence and daily revisit. So for a minute, let's just look at the standard faster RCNN model. One can think of it as a deep convolutional neural net, uh, which is split uh, between uh, by the regional proposal network. That gives you a bunch of proposals which are uh, operating on feature maps, intermediate representations of the imagery. And that's what's fed into our ROI, like region of interest pooling. So, if you alternately fed it an uh, image stack of ground-locked imagery of the same location, you can get to detecting the presence and absence of objects that you're interested in. You go from absolutes to relatives, and that's where deep learning models always tend to perform better. Uh, the modification you'll need to make is you're gonna get like a deep stack of feature maps as well, and you'll need to convolve them to feed that into a standardized regional proposal network. So uh, here, uh, um, here are some examples of like running, how that regional proposal network would work. So here's some indicative results. Here's a target frame of a port, and you can see like uh, the location of a few ships in the range of what we were talking about in terms of size. And here are temporal images. So think of them as each image converted to grayscale, and you stack them up in like different colors so that you can show them on a slide. And what you see in colors are objects that are moving. And sometimes it also shows you areas where you don't have perfect ground lock. But when you run that kind of a region proposal network, you quickly zoom in on things, uh, objects that are moving, and objects of interest that are moving that you want to train on. So that's how we can get to improved performance using spatial temporal stacks. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the possible applications that you can build out with this. So close to San Francisco is Oakland. This is the port of Oakland. And you can see, you know, it has like a range of different objects that are clearly visible in our imagery. You see shipping containers. You see ships coming in and out of the port. Uh, you can detect cars, rail vehicles, and buildings. But in reality, over the course of a month, this is kind of what it looks like. You see ships coming in and out, containers getting docked and undocked. You can see buildings getting constructed. So it's a very live picture of what's actually happening on the ground. So one can think of the next generation of geospatial analytics to be a conflation of not just imagery data sources. So it starts with imagery, but it could go a lot beyond. You can detect a range of different ships just using the kind of capabilities I described. Uh, similar to disaster analytics, you would be able to do them for like different regions. Uh, for object detection. And one could merge that with like signals like AIS where you have uh, indication of where a ship's actually headed, where it's from, give you that kind of information. You can conflate or combine that with real-time 
on-ground traffic signals to indicate like the kind of uh, traffic scenarios you're dealing with on the ground. And you can then merge that with cell phone telemetry to understand the patterns of human activity. This gets us to pattern of life, kind of assessment and analytics, which is using geospatial Earth observation imagery as like one of the sources. Those are the kind of applications that uh, we are enabling our customers and our partners to actually build up. And uh, we, have, we are located in North America with a couple of offices across the United States and Europe. And we're constantly looking for like engineers, uh, machine learning engineers, application developers. You can read a lot more about us uh, on our developer platform and a range of different educational institutions using our data for building rich geospatial applications. So uh, it's been an honor presenting to you all. Uh, thank you very much.